Hello and welcome to The Two View. This is the Cutting Edge Podcast for Emergency and Urgent Care Nurse Practitioners and Physician Assistants. My name is Mike Sharma. I started my PA career in the U.S. Army, including a deployment to Afghanistan. Now I practice emergency and urgent care medicine in Dallas, Texas. With me is my co-host, nurse practitioner, Martha Roberts. Martha, hello. Hey, Mike, what's going on? I'm still doing my COVID hero relief here in Sacramento. I'm pretty excited about it, vaccinating the community. And I'm still updating our awesome new procedures website, theproceduralist.org. And of course, still gearing up for our courses that are happening in 2021 for the Center for Medical Education, which we'll tell you more about at the end of our podcast. By now, we've had a few episodes under our belt, and I am ready to bring you some cutting-edge stuff, Mike. I'm hoping that you'll bring the same, including a few evergreen topics that we like to call them here. But first, let's start off with some good old-fashioned acute pancreatitis to get those juices flowing. Juice. I get it. Juices. Okay, very good. Well, listen, the other day I was driving to the store and listening to a new interview with uh, Dr. Howard Reber. He is an emeritus professor of surgery at UCLA, kind of down in your side of the country. And he co-authored a review of article in the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, published just last month in January 2021. And he said in the interview, I think the idea that in the emergency room, if one makes the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis and gets the sense this patient has mild disease, that it's reasonable, that it's safe to let him go home, I think that's wrong. That's what he said. He thinks that it's wrong to discharge patients with pancreatitis from the ER. And I about drove my car off the road. This is a guy who's been studying the pancreas for decades, who's reviewed 11 years of literature on the pancreas before co-authoring this review in JAMA that eventually took information from 66 articles. And it sounded like he was saying we should not be discharging home even mild pancreatitis from the ED. And that is not what I have seen in the EDs that I work in. Martha, what's your experience with the disposition in these even mild Milder cases. Look, Mike, I have not met a patient with any form of pancreatitis that isn't uncomfortable. They are also incredibly nauseated and oftentimes they're vomiting. And even if it's mild, they still have issues eating, drinking, sleeping, and dealing with their pain. I suppose in the past, if you have a patient with very mild pancreatitis, they might be able to go home if they can tolerate clear liquids and do bowel rest at home. But if you want them to take oral medications for their pain or nausea and they can't keep those down, they're just going to be right back, which is fine because then you took that gamble and maybe you didn't have to deal with them then, but you got to deal with them now. Uh, you know, sometimes it's it's hard to say, you know, some patients also just truly want to go home and rest. And I, I don't disagree with that sometimes. Right. Well, you know, after listening to this interview, it really inspired me to dig into what is the state of the art on ED treatment of pancreatitis. And I think there's a lot of stuff that's important to share and may change people's practice out there. Yes, I totally agree. Well, let's set the stage a bit for our listeners. Acute pancreatitis is one of the most common GI conditions that requires admission in the United States. And about 300,000 patients a year visit the ED because of pancreatitis. But here's the good news. 80% of those patients do not develop severe disease any sort of organ failure. But on the flip side of that is that 20% of patients that do develop severe disease, mortality rates approach 20%. So 20% of pancreatitis patients have a mortality rate of 20%. Obviously, it's important that we know what to look for that would tell us that someone may develop severe pancreatitis. We're going to get to that for sure. Well, first, let's talk about what's going on in acute pancreatitis, the pathophysiology. Well, long story short, the pancreas is basically eating itself. When the pancreas is damaged, you produce trypsin, and that leads to activation of other digestive enzymes. The kinin system is also activated, causing vasodilation, inflammation, and swelling. Well, how does the pancreas get damaged in the first place? Lots of possible reasons. In the U.S., about a quarter of the cases are caused by gallstones and about a quarter are caused by alcohol. I've also personally uh, rarely seen pancreatitis from hypertriglyceridemia. That accounts for about 5% of cases. Sometimes we do it. We cause pancreatitis in our patients after things like an ERCP procedure or endoscopic ultrasound and elevated calcium, autoimmune issues, structural issues like tumor cysts can also cause pancreatitis. Yeah. Don't we feel awful when we're the cause of the sec yeah. uh, secondary disease here? Well, so there's a bunch of medications that can cause pancreatitis as well, like dozens of them. There's drugs like acetaminophen, furosemide, some statins, even marijuana. So look, 
uh, you don't have to worry about memorizing that list. Just know that many of these meds can cause pancreatitis and, you know, might be part of uh, why you can't figure out the cause either if patients aren't telling you those medications that they're on. So also hitting the booze bottle really hard and every day can send people into an attack. I've seen some cases of pancreatitis and even light drinkers who just kind of overdid it that one day. Yeah, well, marijuana being on that list is fascinating to me. Uh, definitely important to keep on our differential diagnosis. If we're hearing about this regular marijuana use, don't anchor on something like cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Don't neglect to look for pancreatitis in these patients. They can look so alike. And speaking of presentation, these patients in pancreatitis in an acute attack are most commonly showing up with a chief complaint of pain. There is some sort of pain and not just nausea and vomiting. The pain's usually constant. It's not colicky or intermittent like other conditions that can cause upper abdominal pain. And sometimes that pain is worsened by things like eating or drinking or lying on your back. Maybe they've had similar pain before because acute pancreatitis can be episodic, recurrent, as we know. Maybe they have some of those risk factors that we've talked about earlier. Yeah, and on exam, there will be tenderness in the upper abdomen and maybe even a little distension with the inflammatory changes that can happen in acute pancreatitis. Rebound tenderness is uncommon and would get me worried about this person having a little more severe disease. If you've heard about these special signs like Cullen's sign, which is bruising around the umbilicus or Gray Turner's side, bruising to the flank, these are all signs of hemorrhagic pancreatitis. That is severe disease. You're not going to have someone with super mild symptoms and great vitals pick up his shirt and be like, whoa. <laughs> right. Well, let's talk about what lab is to order to work this up. A CBC and a CM profile to start to look for things like, you know, liver injury markers that could suggest gallstones or elevated calcium as being the culprits here. But how about lipase and amylase? Let's please stop ordering amylases from the ED. I don't think it's a very common practice, but I could be wrong. Uh, it's very nonspecific. It does not prefer to uh, provide any further diagnostic certainty than an elevated lipase. Cut it out. I, I don't even know why we're talking about this anymore. It should just be off the cover of the but I don't know everyone's practice out there. We're looking for a three times above the uh, lab level for normal to diagnose pancreatitis here. How about imaging? I think it's a super low harm modality to order an ultrasound for every pancreatitis pancreatitis patient. Like we said, 20% of these patients develop severe disease. 20% of those will die. I mean, I have some minimalist tendencies, I know, but with a no radiation test that could change this patient's disposition, identify where we need to send the person to a surgeon instead of a hospitalist. And, you know, one study suggested that ultrasound changed management plans about 50% of the time. That's a lot. I'm going to get an ultrasound. Martha, what do you see in acute pancreatitis patients with regards to CT scanning. I feel like some clinicians are very aggressive when it comes to CT and pancreatitis. Now, you know that I'm a huge fan of ultrasound. I do ultrasound for everything as much as I can all the time. And I feel that my skills are pretty good. However, I don't, uh, well, let me also say I'm not like a super heavy handed CT orderer either. But when it comes to pancreatitis, I am a CT -er. I, I am I am going to admit that that is something that I am a go-to for. In general, CT scanning is, you know, completed when a patient has presented with either a first episode or repeated episodes that might be years later who hasn't had imaging in a while. A CT scan, you know, we do that for various reasons, for to look for tumors, lesions, injuries, bleeding, infection, abscess. You know, there's lots of other unexplained causes of abdominal pain as well. Certainly obstruction is also always on the list. Of course, the radiologist is always going to ask you to get both oral and IV contrast, but I haven't had much luck getting oral contrast in any of these patients with pancreatitis. So that's just a note that I want everyone to think about. I do like uh, giving the patients IV contrast, however. But here are some general guidelines for you when you want to get a CT. So you get a CT for patients whom the clinical diagnosis is in doubt. Number two, Patients with elevated lipase and severe clinical pancreatitis on your exam. That's abdominal distension, tenderness, high fever, leukocytosis. And then patients with a Ranson score greater than three or an Apache score greater than eight. Patients who do not manifest, at, excuse me, patients who do not manifest rapid clinical improvement within 72 hours of initiation of conservative medical therapy, 
maybe that mild case that bounces back to you because you didn't do imaging in the first place. Um, and patients who demonstrate clinical improvement during initial medical therapy, but then manifest an acute change in clinical status of some sort. And that indicates some kind of developing complication. And you should also use the bedside index of severity and acute pancreatitis scoring system to predict mortality and complications, which Mike, I know, is going to talk about in a moment. There are also scores like the Atlanta score, which includes things like mid-epigastric pain, lipase three times the upper limit, SIRS criteria, elevated pulse, respiratory rate, fever, bandemia, elevated CRP, the list goes on. But that all can be done either before or after the CT. It just helps you classify the disease and understand how serious this illness can be. I'll give you that. You know, I think when you've got more serious signs of acute pancreatitis that we're trending towards someone who has more severe presentation of the disease, yeah, I think that CT is definitely indicated there. We're going to do some space repetition in a few minutes and kind of go over some of those guidelines that Martha suggested. Uh, but on CT, what would we find for acute pancreatitis? There may be some, maybe some enlargement of the pancreas, um, some different enhancement of the gland. Maybe the contours of the pancreas are a little bit blurred or shaggy or irregular. We're seeing some of those stranding densities that we can see in other organs we know that get inflamed with different things and maybe even some fluid collections either inside or in the retroperitoneal space here. Um, these fluid collections are usually around the pancreas and maybe anterior to the perirenal spaces, but they can go all the way down to the pelvis uh, just because of how these pancreatic enzymes and kinin can cause inflammation in kind of distant places, you know, uh, and there's complications that can be uh, recognized too, you know, things like pseudocysts, abscesses, necrosis, things like that. Um, keep in mind, a CT can be falsely negative if obtained too early in the disease course. And uh, you can talk more about that here right now. Yeah, you know, it's not uncommon that a patient comes in and gets a CT. They're really sensitive. You know, people have lower pain thresholds. And, you know, you do CT and there's nothing really convincing. They come in like a day or two later and the CT is like, whoa, what happened? This is a, such a crazy change. And nobody wants to give a patient two CTs. But, you know, sometimes it happens. The JAMA review suggested that the CT and even MRI may be indicated when we're thinking about possible structural causes of pancreatitis. But not everybody needs a CT especially during the initial management. So like I said, I'm a little heavy handed uh, when ordering this, but I sometimes, you know, that feeling where you just, you have a patient with a disease process you've seen many times before. It's like, you just like kind of put your aura around their aura for their appendicitis. Uh. And you're like, I know I can, I've had an appendicitis. So sometimes I'm like, I know, bro, this is definitely an appy. But that's not to say that that's how you're supposed to be making all your decisions about CT scanning. But Mike, come on, there's got to be a little bit of like, you know, gestalt here for these diagnoses. You just know, right? Oh, of course. Yeah, I think that gestalt is, you know, something you can't ignore sometimes. But it's also nice to have, you know, guidelines to, to fall back on. If you are kind of on the fence and you choose not to go with imaging, then I think it's nice to have. Um, I really like that there's this, this timeline graphic in the review that helps us understand kind of how these structural changes show up. You know, um, like you mentioned, these fluid collections or other complications, structural complications, may not show up until 24, 36, 72 hours after onset of symptoms. So if they're coming in super early and they're pretty mild, um, those folks may be able to wait even for the hospitalist, perhaps, even if you're going to admit them, the hospitalist perhaps can do the CT scan um, and we don't have to do it necessarily in the ED. Well, right. Well, so, but so how do we nail down the diagnosis of pancreatitis? Let's, let's answer that question. Yeah. It's nice to have, like I mentioned guidelines, cause you can kind of fall back on them. They're generally accepted. And so if people ask you, Hey, why did you do this or not do this? If you can point to a guideline in addition to your gestalt or against your gestalt, that can be helpful and more defensible. Uh, we talked last episode with Ken Milne that guidelines are guidelines, not unbreakable rules like speed limits. You know, there are guidelines for the diagnosis of pancreatitis. And one very common one is called the revised Atlanta classification. You need two of these three, a presentation like we talked about above with upper abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting, lipase or amylase. It's technically in the classification system. Lipase or amylase greater than three times your lab's reference value and CT or MRI findings that suggest acute pancreatitis, two of those three. 
Okay, but we keep coming back to the fact that some of these patients can get really sick. So there are guidelines to help us figure this out as well, the severity scoring systems. We've all heard of Branson's criteria, which is the granddaddy. You like that word. That's like your favorite word. However, it's it's a dad word. Sorry. However, it's a pain in the butt. And some of the data you need isn't drawn until about 48 hours after admission. So the young gun on the scene is this... Uh, we say it's BICEP, yeah? I mean, the bedside yes. index for severity in acute pancreatitis. We can call it the BICEP. and requires only five data points. And the acronym even helps you remember these five points. So super cool. Here we go. B, that's the BUN greater than 25. I, that stands for impaired mental status. S, that's our SIRS criteria. A, age greater than 60. And P, plural effusion on imaging, which, by the way, that is no bueno. If you're all negative and zero, there is a less than 1% chance of risk of mortality. And, you know, I like those odds. Yeah, I do too. You know, in the end, all these guidelines have high false positive rates. Some relatively recent literature says, look, don't do all these complicated classification systems for severity. Just look at your SIRS criteria. We have two studies that cover this in our show notes. And, you know, Tintin Alley's the, the grand mammy, maybe, of our EM texts here. One of them, their comprehensive study guide, ninth edition, has gone so far as to say that SIRS criteria protects severe acute pancreatitis <coughs> more simply and as accurately as the various scoring systems. So maybe you just look at your SIRS criteria. Let's cover treatment. You know, we in the yeah. ER usually think in terms of fluid replacement and pain control. But something the JAMA Review article spent a lot of time on was nutritional support and how important it was in decreasing severity and the rate of infectious complications. Martha, these people need turkey Turkey sandwiches. sandwiches. <laughs> Therapeutic. Okay, turkey sandwiches. Let's go over fluid first. If you're suspecting pancreatitis, this is not the time to be stingy with IV fluids. Go ahead and give two liters from the jump, even if the patient's vital signs are okay. This is one time where lactated ringers may be the one you go with. There is some low to moderate evidence that suggests LR in pancreatitis is associated with decreased complications as compared to normal saline. I love lactated ringers. You know, sometimes I just hold that bag like in my arms and stroke it gently because it is such a lovely bag of fluid. Although I clearly have problems. All right. Pain control. Let's get back to that. It depends <laughs> on the patient. We have lots of opioid and non-opioid modalities in the ED. But what about this nutritional support? Why? Like we talked about earlier in acute pancreatitis, the pancreas is literally eating itself. Okay. And if the disease progresses, you're going to get more widespread inflammation. And this means more nutritional requirements. In addition, you get your gut mucosa, your intestinal lining can be affected, and you get some increased ability for gut bacteria to go from the inside of your interstitial lumen into the systemic circulation. Now, these bacteria are going everywhere and possibly causing multiple oral organ failure and secondary infection of any pancreatic fluid collections. When patients eat, you're addressing the nutritional requirements as well as increasing blood flow and motility to the intestines and reducing infectious complications. We are all about the evidence here at The Two View, and there is not any evidence supporting what I think is a common practice of making these patients NPO or putting them on clear liquid diets. You know what? There was a Cochrane meta-analysis of 348 patients that found that enteral nutrition, so eating, right, through the mouth, whatever the patient can tolerate, you know, some sort of low fat, soft or solid diet, that kind of diet was associated with a risk reduction of about 0 0.5 in mortality, organ failure, and systemic, and systemic infection. Let them eat. <laughs> Part them off even as early as within the first 24 hours if you can get that volume to come down. Yes, we all understand that eating, you know, is part of the process of healing. I do get that. Um, however, some of these patients just aren't going to be able to do it or they might be afraid to eat. So just keep that in mind. Plus, if these patients are really, you know, they're not going to be in your ER for 24 hours. God, I hope not. So um, don't maybe just keep them NPO until you talk to the hospitalist and decide what they want to do. So speaking of that, let's talk about disposition. One of the most important parts of our job, of course, if there's pain uncontrolled by oral meds, uncontrollable vomiting, and a suggestion of increased severity by one of the scoring systems that we talked about here today, or a suggestion of gallstone pancreatitis, these patients should get admitted, okay? Maybe even go to the ICU, depending on how severe they are. Don't underestimate how sick the pancreas can get. A patient diagnosed with pancreatitis for the first time should 
most likely be admitted, okay? But what's nice about pancreatitis is that these patients do not always crash and burn. There's this like kind of slow slide into like badness here. And we think that in a reliable patient, with an established history of pancreatitis and low likelihood of severity, these patients can be sent home safely with clear instructions to return if new symptoms. Um, and if they're getting worse or they're just not getting better as expected, outpatient GI follow-up is important as well as resources for alcohol cessation if that's involved. Well, maybe that changed some folks' practice and uh, kind of mentality towards pancreatitis out there. Uh, I know it gave me some new things to think about, too. Let's switch gears into our procedure this month, all available for your review on theproceduralist.org. That's theproceduralist.org. That is our handy-dandy new website bringing you procedural pearls for thought. Let's discuss the scary, loud, but not as cruel as you think device, the cast cutter. I love the cast cutter. Yeah, so we all have had that patient that has come in due for cast removal when they should have followed up with their orthopedic team. And if you're able to consult with the team and they give you a pass to remove the cast, then you need to be handy with the cast cutter in your department. And you may have applied a cast yourself a few days ago and the patient comes back and says, oh, it's just too tight and you have to start from scratch. So we know that can be a slippery slope to deal with. But if the patient has compromised neurovascular status, is saying that they're too numb and tingly to bear the cast, then you got to remove it, restabilize the injury and get the new cast on, man. Yeah. Let's talk about this device. You know, the cast cutter is a handheld machine that you know, is powered by electricity and it's able to get rid of casting material without stripping or damaging the skin beneath. And I, I would love to do this with kids when I get them just to kind of, and show also clinicians because you start introducing this to clinicians and they are even concerned about cutting the patient. So it's, you can take this serrated blade, you know, this kind of like toothy blade, it usually oscillates. It goes back and forth. It does not do a full rotation like a, you know, a buzzsaw or something. I would show the kids or their clinicians, I would tap it against my open palm and that would not break the skin at all. Just make sure you pick some sort of a uh, tougher area. I did it against the back of my hand once. It did kind of scratch up a little bit. So still be careful, but you know, it's a nice, you know, kind of thing to show kids and clinicians that, Hey, this is not something to be scared of necessarily this, uh, you know, special pneumatic or air motor or a compressed air engine, it expands compressed air and it helps the uh, energy to be guided in a linear or rotary motion. And we see these in all kinds of other devices like dental drills, tire changers, Torpedoes, that's even cool. And, and, you know, for your history buffs, these things have been used for hundreds of years in cars. The first successful application of this pneumatic motor in transportation was the McCarsky <coughs> system, air engine used in locomotives, choo-choo trains. Yo, cool history, bro. But in general... Cast saw cutters, uh, though, are handheld, portable instruments. You can take them pretty much anyway, anywhere. And, uh, you know, I think that you can basically use them on any fiberglass uh, or uh, the other material. It's escaping my mind right now. What, uh, what, am, I, what am I thinking of, Mike? Plaster, the, orthoglass is a brand name. Yes, orthoglass, right. So okay. there's fiberglass, orthoglass, um, and our plaster cast. It'll cut through all of those things. So... You know, when you want to use this, again, you want to kind of prep the patient, let them know the oscillating blades are going to vibrate. Presently, there are a bunch of different types of cast cutters on the market, and they come in all shapes, sizes, loudness, so on and so forth. I, I know a ton of companies do make them, but I do want to suggest either the Striker or the Martin. Those are pretty good ones. I like those. Good. Okay. Well, you know, like I said, they are scary do some pre-procedure teaching to the patient and maybe even the parent. Maybe they, they might be scared more than anybody else here as far as before you come at them with some gloves and the mask and the saw. Um, here's something else I want to keep in mind as well. You know, we are no stranger, I feel like, to eye protection right now in the ER. A lot of us are masking and also wearing some sort of eye shield. It's a nice thing to give the patient some eye protection too. find some eye pro in your ER because when we're using these saws, they can spit little, you know, dust and particles off, you know, at people. And so would that be awful? It's like, Hey, good news. Your cast is off bad news. Let's fix that corneal abrasion now. So go ahead and put eye protection on yourself and then put it on the patient too. They'll have to listen to our uh, last podcast to take care of that. <laughs> so tell us some final pearls, Mike. Okay, you got it. Well, you know, like I said, it does not cut through 
padding, stockinette, the cotton material underneath. So you're just kind of taking the saw and going down to that level. And then you're pulling the hard, um, you know, plaster, fiberglass off. And then you will cut the padding or stockinette with trauma shears, scissors, whatever else here. Consider your patient. They do make pediatric cast saws. And so if that is kind of your bigger patient population, maybe your department, you know, shills out for a, you know, a peds cast saw that is quieter. Um, also, these are um, portable, depending on the kind of cast saw you get. They can also be kind of messy, and your triage is going to be kind of upset with you if you just shoot fiberglass dust all over the triage area. So don't just do this in the middle of triage. Find a nice place out of the way that can be cleaned up later on. Okay. And lastly, these blades wear out. So keep it on the device, understand what sort of maintenance and compliance checks need to be done and that you're replacing these blades uh, routinely and as directed by the manufacturer. Yeah. Okay. Also a few pearls that I got from science direct, which is a great education site. They remind us that sawing over bony prominences should be avoided because skin injuries can potentially occur at these locations. A long strip of rigid plastic is sometimes used to slip inside the cast to sort of form a barrier between the saw blade and the patient's skin. And this is especially useful when removing a cast from an anxious patient. If that isn't available, then you can just stick a wooden de uh, tongue depressor in there. That oh. can be used to protect the, yeah, nice little pearl skin um, to protect the skin from the uh, cast. And then when you're sawing, the blade should be firmly pressed against the cast at a 90 degree angle, okay? It can be felt there uh, to completely cut through the cast shell, lift it in and out in repeated motions as you take off um, the, if you, as you move the oscillating blade up and down at that 90 degree angle, and that will minimize any skin burns or abrasions. If it becomes too hot, these things do get hot. You can just take a little break. Don't risk burning the patient. And the cast should be cut on both sides. Now, that's the key here. I really want to end with that. And the video will show you this as well. Both sides. Use a cast spreader to then further widen the cut until the, the two shells basically can be separated and removed. And then you can use scissors to cut the rest of the garbage in between. This is one of those procedures that you, you know, there's some unexpected details you might not think of when you just kind of do this for the first time. So definitely watch one very closely. And then, of course, the next one is do one and teach one, you know. Consider all the pearls. Watch the video at theproceduralist.org. That is theproceduralist.org to show you more tips and tricks on how exactly to master this must know procedure. Uh, it's super fun, frankly. I love cutting casts off people. And, and who know though? Who knew that it had to, you know, require this much thought and uh, kind of premeditation, so to speak. Okay, let's move on to our last two topics. But before we do that, it's my distinct honor to introduce our guest faculty member today, and that is he is. Dr. Jim Roberts, who is a fellow in medical toxicology and emergency medicine. He is one of our original CCME faculty members participating in lectures across the country and the world for over 40 years. Jim is the lead author and editor of Roberts and Hedges. He's the Roberts of Roberts and Hedges, Clinical Procedures and Emergency Medicine Textbook. He was also one of the very first emergency medicine physicians in the country and helped design and run the first ER residency programs. He has won hundreds of awards, including those from SAEM, ASEP, AAEM, and more. He was a founding member of EMRA. He is a distinguished professor, nominated as one of the best doctors in the country multiple times in his career, and is the chairman of the board for Emergency Medicine News. His column, In Focus, has been published for over 35 years. Most recently, he retired as a chairman from Mercy Hospital of Philadelphia in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. On top of that, he's Martha's dad, and they work on a ton of projects together, which is super cool. Hi, Jim. How's it going? Good. It sounds like a great guy. <laughs> yeah, he's all right. Yeah. So, all right, let's get right into our question and answer segment before we quiz Jim on migraines and migraine treatment. So, Jim and the rest of the faculty panel help answer questions at our boot camps during our question series, our panel questions. We bring up our top faculty and we answer your questions. He also sits at the fact check table with me and we answer questions during the course. Now, let me tell you one course Jim and I answered. 1,800 questions, 1,800 questions or more. Literally, I am not kidding. And we may not know the answer to every single question. We, we do an okay job, but we set up four or five computers, textbooks, links to our participants with a, a chat forum. 
and we have uh, literature, evidence-based information, and all the answers that we can find. So with that being said, I thought it would be fitting that we sort of bring this concept into our podcast with a new uh-huh. series that we're calling Quick Bit Questions. I like it. I like the name. Yeah. So we're going to pull some questions from Facebook, um, and we're going to see between myself, Mike, and Jim if we can answer some of them for you. Let's go to the first one, Mike. I'm going to read this one. And yeah. this question was taken off of the Facebook group Nurse Practitioner Newbies. I think that has over like 19,000 followers. So huge. The, the question is, okay, and I think this is interesting. Once you get the vaccine, okay, we're talking about the COVID vaccine, which is going to be around for some time now. And there are lots of different places you can uh, get, excuse me, lots of different types of vaccine that you can get. But the question that was asked is, if you don't have side effects after you get the vaccine, did you not get the real thing? Mm. And should you need to get an antibody test? What's the answer? No and no. (laughs) Did everyone get a reaction from a vaccine? No, but that didn't mean that you didn't get the vaccine. And uh, about 30% of the people who have the disease don't have any symptoms. Exactly. Right. So, you know, we called our good friend Diane Birnbauer on this one as well this morning. And she basically is saying this misinformation has to stop. You take both the shots. If you don't get symptoms, it doesn't matter. You don't need to go get an antibody test. Period. Yeah. Exactly. We're going to have the information from the CDC on what percentage of people get side effects after the first and the second Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in our show notes. For example, as pulling from the Pfizer, uh, you know, information, 40 percent of people don't get fatigue after the second Pfizer vaccination. Forty eight percent of people don't get headache. Sixty five percent of people don't get chills. There is no known connection between antibody levels and how well your vaccine uh, took at the time. Any information you would get from an antibody test would not be actionable. And you know, one of the tenets of emergency medicine, Jim, you probably coined this one here, is don't do a test if you don't know what you're gonna do with the information. You know, speaking of, as of the time of this recording, I'm 27 hours out for my second Moderna vaccine, and I feel great. I could go work a shift in the ER right now. I don't think anyone noticed that I've been off my game, I don't think, when we were talking before recording. So, look, please don't be afraid of the vaccines. Please reach out to us if you like. If you want some, you know, no shaming, no judgment talk about the vaccines, you can hit us up at twoviewcast at gmail.com. That is the number two, twoviewcast at gmail.com, or you can get us on Twitter as well. Now, Jim, you have been in the emergency medicine world for a very long time. And, you know, what is your general statement right now? And how do you feel about the COVID vaccine? Are you yourself getting it? Would you recommend it to everybody? Well, I think people ought to get it. Um, I've been trying now for the last month in Florida to sign up to even get an appointment. Can't seem to get one. Of course, nothing but old people in Florida. So uh, they all qualify. Uh, But sure, I don't know. It's a bad disease. And um, it's preventable. And I think you should get the vaccination. Uh, No downsides. Excellent advice. Okay, let's go to our next question. We only have two more. And then we're going to get right into migraines. This next question comes from the emergency room APP, APC group on Facebook. And it has about 6,000 members. This question comes from, I believe it's pronounced Lisa. She's got two E's in her name. Ball Tune. And she asked this. Hey, I'm about to start a new job. The problem is I haven't worked since May when nothing COVID is the same as it is now. What's a good reference to get me up to speed on current COVID diagnosing treatment protocols and advice for patients? I don't want to be too far on the game on this. And you know what? This certainly in months to come, this is going to be constantly changing. And that's why we're not going to actually give you an exact answer for COVID right now. We're just going to give you some resources. And Jim, didn't you just write about this as well for EM News? Yeah, EM News has dozens of articles on it, and they're all fairly up to date. So if you want to go to EM News on uh, on the internet and just type in COVID-19, uh, or coronavirus infections, you get all the latest data from uh, presentation, um, what to do for the patients, uh, laboratory testing, that sort of stuff. It's an easy way to easy way to get up written specifically for people who are working in the emergency room. Awesome. You can also just 
Google it, and you'll get stuff from from uh, from a variety of governmental agencies, the NIH, and those sorts of things. It'll give you an update. Yeah, Mike, you said you had a couple of things. The NIH and the CDC were pretty good. Yeah, there is. If you Google uh, or search for, not to be uh, you know brand specific here, uh, you know these NIH and CDC guidelines for treatment. It's a very meaty text. Lots of references, not just what to do, but why these things are being recommended. We're all about the evidence over here. Uh, so it's awesome if you like getting nerdy. It's a free resource. We will post that resource on our show notes as well. Okay, and one, one other thing, thing Mike. I was going to say, one thing you can count on, though, it's all going to change in the next couple of months. Uh, if something you think you're, is uh, is known and uh, set next two months from now could be all different. That's right. But I also just wanted to remind our listeners that our friends at MRAP, uh, MRAP has some great resources, and they do free live podcasts as well, where they talk about COVID in general and specific as well. And there's a live question and answer series that they do on YouTube, which is absolutely phenomenal. So check out MRAP. That is a great resource. And I would also like to put a plug for them for the uh, acute pancreatitis portion that we spoke about. They have a great summary and we'll list that in our show notes as well. All of that for you. Cool. Well, Question three is more of feedback and less of a question from our last episode. We talked about the 2020 BLS and ACLS guidelines. I brought up the suggestion from, you know, the AHA text of using a metronome app to help ensure that the compressor was compressing at the appropriate rate, 100 to 120 beats per minute. Well, my friend, P.A. Chip Lang, who I'm doing an ATLS series with on his long-running podcast, Total EM, he pointed me towards a 2014 article in the Emergency Medicine Journal affiliated with the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, about metronomes and CPR. Uh, it concluded after reviewing a couple dozen articles that talked about this topic that the use of metronomes to guide the rate at which chest compressions are delivered is associated with improved rates closer to those recommended in the current resuscitation guidelines. So better rates, better odds of success, better return to ROSC. Thanks, Chip, for listening. And that article will also be in our show notes. You can go to twoview.fireside.fm. That's the number two, twoview.fireside.fm for all those show notes and references from throughout our podcast today. Now, Jim, you actually lived the staying alive era, so you should be able to sing that song while you do chest compressions pretty well. Maybe even do a little dance. That's right. All right. Now, we're going to get right into headaches now. Okay. The headache of treating headaches, specifically speaking, the diagnosis of migraine, either known or suspected when all the other terrible things are ruled out and your diagnosis is made as migraine. Keep that in mind as we talk about treatments here because obviously the treatment for a subarachnoid stroke, all these other oddities that can happen, um, they're all going to be different, all right? We're talking about migraines. And, you know, I was actually thinking when I was doing some research for this, I, I came across a lot of literature about occipital neuralgia, which is a different treatment in most of the time. Um, we are going to cover that in a future podcast and discuss some tips and tricks for that. And uh, I, I personally think that that can be a really great talent that we have in the ED to do these injections. But I digress. Let's talk about migraines. I've had them. Maybe you've had them. Maybe you've had a frequent flyer that swears the only thing that works for them is three doses of Dilaudid, a Benadryl push, and a turkey sandwich. That's twice now we've got turkey sandwich in our podcast today. I'm really hungry. <laughs> So don't worry, we're going to simplify the treatments and approaches for migraine for you, evidence-based stuff, as well as the 40-some years experience that Jim has um, treating a migraine. He can literally do it in his sleep. Um, we know there's hundreds of tips and tricks and treatments for migraines these days, and they include some of them include ketamine, propofol, Botox, meditation, pressure points, maybe even witchcraft, maybe some holistic <laughs> approaches, lavender pads, and maybe even some downright prayer. But I can tell you, narcotics are well studied in regards to headaches, as are combo drugs like Excedrin. And both of those drugs are bad, bad, bad. Those are not recommended, nor are they supported by the literature, American Headache Society, neurologists, and many others. But let's just go ahead and get Jim to tell us the top three treatments for migraine, which you've written about a lot, Jim. Well, there, there, are, there are dozens of articles and dozens of treatments, actually, for 
for migraines. Um, I think the, the standard treatment for headaches like the NSAIDs, acetaminophen, aspirin, uh, you're not going to be worried about using those in the ER. Patients are too sick when they come to the ER. That the, They probably already tried them. Uh, they're of minimal value in someone who's really ill. So I would say that I would not consider them in your armamentarium. Toradol, for example, has got a lot of bad press recently about not using more than 10 or 15 milligrams. And uh, although it, it's an okay analgesic, uh, should be something you'd be given for something that has real pain, such as a migraine. It doesn't really specific anti-physiological treatment as do some of the other uh, drugs. The drug that is most familiar, most has most history with it, is sumatriptan. There's seven or eight triptans. All of them are pills except sumatriptan. Now, if you're going to be treating somebody with a migraine, you want to give it parenterally. You don't want to give them a pill. It takes long to work. The GI absorption can be decreased in some of the migraines. So forget about giving pills uh, and those minor analgesics for someone with it. Um, you know, also, dihydroergotamine. Uh, not frequently used by some of the younger docs, but it's a great specific treatment uh, for, for, for migraines, and it works quite well. Um, metoclopramide, Reglan, very, very commonly used, um, has, a little, has some specific effect on the anti-migraine physiology. Uh, I think people underuse metoclopramide. Uh, Compazine is another drug which uh, I've had a lot of experience with. In general, I think you ought to use two drugs, and you ought to use enough of them. Giving a small amount of drugs and then seeing if they work and then giving it again is not the best way. You want to approach a migraine with uh, a, a large dose of a drug that's going to work probably within just one dose. Putting the patient to sleep is a good idea. They go to sleep, they wake up, their migraine is gone. So if you use a combination of medications, you're going to, you're going to help. 10 milligrams of metoclopramide, popular, I think way under doses. Someone who goes for chemotherapy uh, and you, you give them a Reglan before the chemotherapy, they're getting 60, 80 milligrams as an IV push. You know, and nobody worries about that. Somebody worries about 20 milligrams of metoclopramide for someone who has a migraine. And again, one of the two drugs you ought to be given, and, and it's a good one. It has very few side effects and uh, uh, is, is very useful. Sumatriptan, six milligrams sub Q, pretty good drug, very few downsides. Uh, it does, uh, it is sort of a, a serotonin agonist. So uh, if someone is on a drug that, that, that um, like a, a SSRI that has increased serotonin, uh, you might have a little bit of a serotonin effect. But Reglan and, uh, um, sumat and sumatriptan together, nice combination, 20 milligrams of Reglan, six milligrams of sumatriptan, and I also would give a little Benadryl with that, uh, like 12.5 milligrams, turn the lights out and close the door, let the patient go to sleep. There's nothing wrong with them sleeping. Also, you gotta put them on a monitor, you gotta put, give them a start of an IV. When the family comes in and they see somebody that's got a monitor or an IV, oh, they're really getting great specific treatment. You guys are, you guys are super here, man. He's got that IV with that fancy stuff going in there. Uh, and and you know, his heart's even being monitored. There's no heart problems with treating migraines, but, uh, but it, it just makes, it makes you look like a, like a, like a real pro. I started out uh, a number of years ago with uh, compazine and dihydroergotamine as a combination. One milligram of dihydroergotamine and uh, uh, 10 milligrams of compazine IV and then 12.5 of Benadryl. You give all of them in about a five-minute period, cured about 80 or 90 percent of migraines. Many times the patients will go to sleep because they're somewhat sedated, but I think that's a great combination. Dihydroergotamine, compazine, and, uh, and, and some Benadryl. Some people uh, are using a combination now, and there's a couple of articles on it. Uh, about uh, uh, sumatriptan and naproxen. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure exactly why that should uh, be of any great value, but there's a couple of articles that say it's very good. Uh, again, if you're going to use a drug, use more than one. Don't give them in, in a pediatric dose. Give them in an adult dose, and uh, uh, you know, give them enough that it's going to work. Again, putting them to sleep is always good. When they go home, 10 milligrams of uh, dexamethasone IV 
we're going to decrease the number of people who come back. Uh, dexamethasone, it's an inflammatory process, a migraine. It's a neuroinflammatory condition. And um, uh, 10 milligrams of, of, uh, of decadron, good before they, before they leave. When they go home, uh, you can give them a couple of things. I like a, a script for composite. Uh, tell them the first, when they first feel a headache coming on, take 10 milligrams of composite. It will short circuit the, short circuit the, uh, uh, the headache a number of times. Uh, you know, you can give them some, some NSAIDs or some other, you know, kind of nabby pammy meds, but, you know, give them a real drug. Uh, and I think composite is probably one of your better ones. Some people also, uh, give them Reglan again, 10 milligrams of PO Reglan, you know, it's whistling in the wind. Uh, give them 10, give them 20, 30 milligrams of Reglan PO if you're trying to abort uh, a migraine that comes on. Uh, Sumatriptan, you know, they won't have that at home because it's an injection. But, okay, you said a lot of stuff, Jim, all right? This is like the story of my childhood. So you said a lot of stuff. We need to dissect just a wee bit. So, Mike, will you recap the three drugs that are the most effective and uh, suggested in the literature? Yeah, and you know. I think that there's, you know, it depends on who you ask, frankly. But, you know, just to summarize what Jim talked about, and I thought that was great, and, and I just learned some stuff right there from listening to him. So thank you, Jim, for that. Um, so some of the higher indication medications are things like our prochlorperazine, that's compazine, and metoclopamide, that's Reglan. These are Class B recommendations by a lot of the big societies here. So combining that with Benadryl, not necessarily for like prevention of akathisia, which you'll never forget when you see it for the first time, but it gets people to sleep. And that's almost as good of a treatment for a headache as anything else. Some of these folks just want to go to bed. So I like putting that together. So one of those medications, procloperazine plus metoclopramide, composite or reglin, plus some Benadryl here. Triptans, also high yield. Of course, there are contraindications for triptans. You want to avoid in patients with cardiovascular disease. You want to avoid in patients who have maybe other things that can be serotonin receptor uh, agonists. You want to avoid in other certain medications. Look up uh, the medications that are contraindicated there, like amitriptyline. But triptans, awesome drugs. You can give them sub-Q. And by the way, you know, the oral formulations, what do we teach our patients? Hey, take the triptan right away as soon as your headache starts. Well, guess what? The sub Q simitriptan, you can give days into this headache and it still works very well, the sub Q thing. So don't worry about, ah, it's too late to use a simitriptan. Don't worry about that. Lastly, some of our go tos for a lot of people Ketorolac, Toradol, our other oral NSAIDs. Um, there's not really any benefit at one over the other with those. Um, and those are actually kind of a lower level recommendation drugs for the treatment of migraines specifically. Yeah. Okay. So I don't want to digress too much, but because we don't frequently get a toxicologist on our call, I do just want to mention something that Jim had talked about, you know, the patients that are, are taking SSRIs, you know, like our Sertaline, Zoloft, Prozac, et cetera. And then, hey, maybe I want to give them a triptan. Is that too much of a risky business? Are we going to run the risk of serotonin syndrome, you know? And, uh, you know, I'd like, Jim, just for you to comment a couple uh, words on that. But then also, if a patient is going to have serotonin syndrome, you know, what's that going to look like? I'm just, you know, want to put that out there for our listeners. Well, most docs don't have a lot of experience with serotonin syndrome. And um, given all the drugs that increase your serotonin levels, and everybody in the world's on an SSRI, uh, I'm surprised that there's not more of it. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if some people are seeing it or maybe just missing it. Um, it does cause some nonspecific symptoms that may be difficult to really ferret out. But uh, the, the true serotonin syndrome, they get agitated and restless. Some people might blame that on the, uh, on the medication they're taking. They can get confused, tachycardic. They can sweat a lot, get some diarrhea. Uh, they just don't feel well. And a lot of times that's misdiagnosed as, uh, as a reaction to the medication or just in a worsening uh, worsening that's not really thought to be uh, a serotonin syndrome. If they have those symptoms, give them a little Ativan, a little Valium, usually takes care of it. Ciproheptadine is an interesting drug, periactin, uh, which is uh, got, uh, not used very much. Most hospitals may not even carry it, but it's an, actually a very good drug for, uh, for treatment of serotonin syndrome. So if you get somebody who you precipitated a serotonin syndrome in, most of the time it's going to go away. 
maybe a little bit of a benzodiazepine will help. Uh, you can give them the periaptin. Um, really severe ones where they get ad they get muscular rigidity and really tachycardic and really confused. You know, they're, that's a serious problem, and they need to be in the hospital uh, and treated with uh, high dose sedatives. Uh, and uh, you, you usually, uh, usually. They do okay. I have not personally seen a death from a serotonin syndrome precipitated by any treatment in the emergency department. All right. So let's move us along sort of toward our, our last couple of questions here. We did sort of address the Benadryl thing, so I don't want to make too big a stink about that. But, you know, as, as Jim and Mike have both said, that the Benadryl is what really gets patients to sleep, and that's maybe what they need. You know, there are a few papers that say you shouldn't be giving this as a, a precursor to whatever antidopaminergic that you're giving, like the Compazine or the Reglan, but... That's fine. Now, we've also addressed the fluid thing. Who doesn't look hot and sexy with an IV in place, right? You know, this is this is like you're getting good treatment. Um, and also, uh, this last thing, you know, Mike, maybe a word on just the ketamine and the propofol, if that's something we're considering. Yeah, so those are some additional medications you might want to consider if you've tried all the things already uh, that you are usually in your armamentarium and they're not working. So ketamine, propofol for headaches that just won't go away. Um, you know, so that's one thing. If if a person is really not really in the mood to stay uh, as an admission here, or maybe this is someone who needs to be admitted and given kind of more medications by IV, especially if they're not tolerating PO very well. If you're kind of at that point where you've tried kind of cocktail number one, cocktail number two, don't keep a migraine patient for 12 hours in ER just trying stuff after stuff after stuff. Make it an admission get some, you know, consultation in there. Hey, maybe something else funny is going on. Have a neurologist, have a hospitalist take a look at that. And they can do, you know, serial treatments in an observation unit or on the med search floor. Yeah, these are not the kind of patients you want waiting in the ER for two or three hours because they just have a headache. You know, the earlier you treat a, a migraine, the better are your results, particularly with the, with the trip down. So I get them in the ER and get them treated. A couple other just minor uh, points to make you look more like a pro, uh, give them a, a name of a neurologist if they haven't ha if they don't have one. Because neurologists, then that's a large part of their practice. They've got a lot of tricks and so on with migraine and specific drugs. Uh, Neurotech is one that, uh, that blocks the uh, calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor. And uh, you, know, you see that on television and you know, it works in an hour or two. Uh, uh, and you got to just keep that in mind. You're probably not going to be prescribing that from the ER or, or giving it to your patient. But uh, make sure they have some follow-up. Give them the name of a neurologist. Tell them what you, you gave them. If you gave them a drug and they say, man, I feel great. Let me go. I want to go. Say, listen, here's what I gave you. I gave you 20 milligrams of metoclopramide. I gave you 10 milligrams of compazine. And I gave you, you know, 12 milligrams of Benadryl. It's going to be on your discharge page, but next time you have a migraine and you go to the emergency room, you say, well, you know, I, I got a migraine. I'll tell you what worked last time. And uh, that's, what they, that's what you should probably give them a try the next time. So uh, don't keep those things a secret. A lot of people, you know, they get treated. They go to the doctor and say, what did they do for you? Yeah, they gave me some medicines, made me feel a lot better. I don't really know what they were. The doctor's not going to call up the ER and ask them, you know, kind of how they were treated. So let your patient know what you gave them. Keep it a secret. I just love it. All right. You know what? There's one last thing I want to ask you about when it comes to migraines, because it's an old school thing and I want to see what you think about it. So, um, there is some thought that caffeine can have a, a value for patients, but that has often been concluded to be because it heightens the effects of things like aspirin and other drugs when combined. But, um, you know, some of these drugs do have a synergistic effect and one of them, uh, may not be useful by itself, but useful to when together. And that makes me want to ask you a little bit about Furacet, which is, again, a combination drug of acetaminophen, caffeine, and butalbital, which is a barbiturate. Now, Jim, you knew about barbiturates way before they were cool. So <laughs> what is your thought on these drugs, and should we still be using them? Well, you're both too young to know about Furacet, uh, because that's who's doing all the back in the uh, 70s and 80s when they uh, when they had a headache. But uh, I actually think caffeine treats a headache. You know, I tell, I tell, tell, my, tell my wife when she has a headache, you know, go have a cup of coffee. A lot of times it makes her feel a whole lot better. So there is, there is some therapeutic benefit, I think, of caffeine. Maybe hard to prove in a scientific way, but 
A lot of people feel better after they have a cup of coffee, particularly if they drink three or four cups a day. And now they, they haven't had one that morning. They're a little caffeine withdrawal. So uh, I think caffeine is good. Fioraset, not a very powerful drug, um, not used very much anymore. Uh, I think it's kind of lost its, its, uh, real, its popularity. Barbiturates, very, used to be very common. You know, every, every old housewife that uh, drank a little too much at night took a sink and all. You know, single barbital to go to bed at night, and occasionally you get an overdose. So barbiturates are very, very common, very popular. Hardly see them anymore. I'm not even sure that they make secanol anymore. But uh, uh, but phenobar but barbiturates, you know, phenobarb is good for seizures and for for some sedation and stuff like that. But you don't see many of nembutal or secanol around anymore. Uh, but uh, they, they were very popular. Then an overdose of a of a barbiturate, um, um, put them on a ventilator. Give them some oxygen, support the pressure if you need to. They usually do okay. It's, it's a relatively non-lethal overdose uh, once they're in the hospital. But uh, but they can't. You know they take. Well, I think Marilyn Monroe took four or five Secanol after she had a bottle of uh, vodka, and she never woke up. So um, you know they're very 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 powerful, particularly when combined with alcohol. Well, her headache surely went away. That's yes. for sure. All right, that was a terrible joke. Uh, yes, let, let's just uh, let's clean it up a little bit here. Uh, I guess is there, you know, maybe we should just quickly run through a case, just a real fast one. I know we're kind of over time, but let's go through a quick case and then how Jim would treat that, and then we'll get to the two view trivia uh, question and answer, as well as our new question, and we'll we'll round things out. How's that sound? Good. Good. Okay. Great. All right. So the case is a 23 year old female. She comes to your emergency department. It's about nine o'clock at night. And she's telling you that she's got a really bad headache. She says it feels like her usual migraine. She's had migraines before. Her vital signs are okay. She's a little 90 to 100 on the monitor heart rate. Her blood pressure is 100 over 70. Uh, but she's afebrile and she otherwise, you know, looks pretty tired. She looks like she's in pain. She's been vomiting. And she says she just can't really get this headache you know, taken care of. She's taken some Motrin, some Tylenol, and she said even some aspirin, and nothing's done the trick. What do we do for this young lady? Well, first of all, I think there's some background you want to get in this patient. First of all, how was the diagnosis of migraine made? Was it her diagnosis? Was it her doctor's diagnosis? Had she ever seen a neurologist? I always ask her, have you ever had a CAT scan? Uh, not that she, she needs a CAT scan, but if she's had a CAT scan, that means somebody really took an interest in her and, and evaluated her, and she probably has made the right diagnosis. A lot of times the, the diagnosis is made uh, by the family doctor based just on, on history and, and uh, presentation, and uh, there is no test, of course, for, for a migraine. Uh, there's no way to prove it. It's just a constellation of symptoms. Uh, ask about family members. Very hereditary. If your, your mother had migraines, you're probably going to have migraines. Uh, it's very, more common in females and um, uh, very, very uh, common uh, for, the, for the daughters of mothers who have a lot of trouble with migraines to get it. So that just sort of proves more uh, that's actually a, a migraine you're talking about. Um, and uh, I ask what worked in the past. If, if, if you're going to treat her, say, well, you've been to the hospital before. You've had migraines. Uh, what worked? Sometimes they know, and again, the doctor should be telling them, you know, I gave you metoclopramide or I gave you, you know, sumatriptan, uh, so she can tell you what worked in the past. And I think that's an error not to, not to tell them. And I always tell them, I'm going to give you the name of the medicine. I want you to remember the name because it seemed to work well. And the next time, uh, the doctor will know exactly what to do to do right away. So, you know, all those things, and you're, you're sure that it's a migraine. 23 is uh, a little young for, for to have status migraines, but you, but you can. You can get them in your – kids can get migraines. You get, um, your pediatric migraine is, is another common diagnosis. Uh, her, I would probably give Copazine and Reglan and some Benadryl and uh, put her in a quiet room, turn the lights out, close the door, probably start an IV uh, and um, – uh, you know, make sure the, the family sees the IV in her because uh, you're giving her great treatment of that, whatever that NS stuff is good to me. Uh, and uh, you know, see if it doesn't put her to sleep. And when she wakes up, she's probably going to be better. And then again, you tell her what you gave her. Now, if it doesn't work, you, you can do a couple of other things. First of all, 
you know, she only gave her five or 10 milligrams of, of Reglan. I think that's not enough. So I, I would say that was an error to, to start with. So a uh, 20, healthy 23-year-old weighs 115 pounds. I give her 20 milligrams of Reglan. And I'd also give her 10 milligrams of Compazine uh, and, uh, and 12.5 of uh, Benadryl. It's probably going to put her to sleep. And it's probably going to cure. So when she wakes up, A, your diagnosis was right. And B, uh, you know, she's fine to go home. And again, write it down. Tell her what you gave her so the next time she knows what it is. Doesn't need a CAT scan. She needs a neurologist follow-up if she hasn't had one. Um, and uh, you give her some warning signs uh, about when to come back. And then, of course, I would, I'd give her some Decadron before she left. Uh, 10 milligrams IV as a, as a one-time shot. And that should take care of the vast majority of this type of patient. Well, Jim, you have not lost your charm, spark, or uh, love for EM, and we really appreciate you coming on the show today and helping us out. Your articles about migraines are available. We'll put them in the liner notes. They're two really great in-focus columns on the treatments for migraine, as well as uh, some of the things that other things that Jim talked about today during this segment. If you have any questions for us, for Mike, for Jim, for me, or any of our previous speakers, you can send us an email at twoviewcast at gmail.com. Now, Mike, why don't you take us out here with the uh, the trivia question? And Jim, you're not allowed to answer, so you be quiet over there. All right. Well, last episode, you were giving away 20% off of any of our courses at the Center for Medical Education to the first person who answered our Two View trivia question. As you recall, here was our question. When were... The first guidelines for CPR published and by who? And the answer, of course, Jim was probably there. He probably participated in these things. This was 1966 by the National Academy of Sciences. The winner of our trivia question was Rick Bowen. Rick, congratulations. He did not, unfortunately, give us anyone to shout out to. So if you know Rick, it was probably you. So shout out to you, friend of Rick Bowen. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, we're going to give you a chance to win another 20% off a course. Maybe you can come hang out with us in July. It's going to be a party. We have a great time. And if you want to read more about our courses, you can go to ccme.org. So here's our question. You know how we like the twos, right? We got, uh, we got our lateral and PA view today from me and Mike, and then we got our oblique view from Jim, our third view today on migraines. But name. Well, here's the question. Name at least two of our physicians on the CCME team who have won an American College of Physician Award, ASEP Award, for either teaching, outstanding contribution in emergency medicine, etc. And the second part of this, which award did they win? We love our physician friends on our team, and we want you to know about their achievements and their strengths. They really are great people. Okay, so that's it. For more information or to give us your feedback, as I mentioned earlier, you can email us at twoviewcast at gmail.com. Visit our faculty site featuring all our upcoming courses at www.ccme.org. And consider coming to see us in Las Vegas, post-vaccine, of course, for our EM boot camp July 11th through the 16th. And check out all our home study courses, our farm course, heart course, EKG course, imaging boot camps, and more on our website. And to check out that cast cutter and our other procedural pearls, you can go to www.theproceduralist.org. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of The Two View. You could subscribe and rate us on Apple iTunes Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. We're in all those big directories. Search for two, the number two view emergency. That's the number two view emergency, and it comes right up. Ratings help us climb the charts so other clinicians can get some two of you goodness like you did today. If you like YouTube and want to see the video blog instead, search for Center for Medical Education. You can catch the video version. You can see all of us together. Don't forget our website where you can go next level any of our topics from any of our episodes, including all the papers and the sites we referred to. That's twoview.fireside.fm. The number two view.fireside.fm. Our audio and video engineers are Ricky Bucata and Dave Pett. Show notes are by Meg Dipple. Thank you again for tuning in. Share this podcast with a friend. Share your thoughts via email. And thanks for sharing your time with us today at The Two View. Have a good day and a great shift.